Good morning again to everyone. And uh, I want to extend a, a very, very warm welcome to all those who have, have joined us online. I'm uh, delighted to see that the program is being kicked off uh, uh, with a introduction to Duchenne. And um, we have uh, the, the privilege of an internationally recognized leader in the Duchenne research world, Dr. James Dowling, joining us. Uh, doc Dr. Dowling is a senior scientist and clinician in the Division of Neurology, Genetics, and Gen uh, Genome Biology program at the Hospital for Sick Children, along with the Department of Pediatrics and Molecular Genetics at the University of Toronto. Uh, Dr. Dowling, uh, welcome. We're, we are looking forward to hearing more about uh, uh, the journey through Duchenne and also some of the emergency care issues and a variety of other things. So uh, it's going to be a most interesting morning. Uh, please, over to you. Hi, great. Thanks, Rick. And uh, thanks for the generous introduction. And thanks to everyone for getting up Saturday morning to, uh, to hear a bit more. I'm hoping to uh, impart a bit of my thoughts and uh, what I think about when I think about Duchenne, and then hopefully we'll have a good opportunity for uh, discussion and questions at the end. So, oh, I need screen sharing enabled. <laughs> So I think Rick or Rochelle, if you can screen share for me or enable it. Ah, excellent, there we go. And okay, I think that worked. Okay. So what is Duchenne? Uh, and I, I apologize, I'm sure that most in the audience probably know the answer to this. Um, and my hope is that uh, this will be geared not just to people who are new to the topic, but also to uh, those who have a fair bit of experience with it as well. So simply put, uh, at least uh, to me, uh, Duchenne is a uh, muscular dystrophy, is a genetic disorder that affects muscle function. Um, and so that's uh, a very uh, broad and simplistic definition. Uh, but I think I want to uh, highlight two important points related to this very simple definition. Uh, the first is that uh, Duchenne is not the only muscular dystrophy, and there are greater than 40 distinct genetic subtypes of muscular dystrophy. And I think it's important to keep in mind uh, because sometimes you'll see general information about muscular dystrophies, which may or may not be applicable to Duchenne. And in other cases, some people will be speaking strictly about Duchenne when they talk about muscular dystrophy in general. Um, and I think it's important also to appreciate specifically what the definition uh, from a, a clinical point of view is of muscular dystrophy. Uh, and, and the definition encompasses these three points here, or really two of these three points, but typically speaking, these three points are present in all individuals who carry the diagnosis of muscular dystrophy. Uh, one is that there are clinical signs and or symptoms of muscle weakness. And these could include uh, difficulties with gait, uh, frequent trips and falls, difficulties getting up off the ground, um, some upper extremity muscle uh, uh, difficulties, such as raising the arms above the head. Um, but uh, there must be some evidence of muscle weakness. Um, and then in terms of the, the diagnostic signs, uh, almost all patients with muscular dystrophy have an elevated blood uh, serine phosphocreatine kinase. Um, and or CPK or CK. Uh, and um, in patients with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, the CPK is invariably elevated and pretty much always above the level of 800. And then uh, on muscle biopsy, when those are ob obtained, uh, there are what we call dystrophic changes. And I've shown here on the right, a classic biopsy from a patient with muscular dystrophy, showing the core features of what are defined as a uh, dystrophic biopsy. And that includes in this uh, blue air stain, um, fibrosis, uh, variation in muscle fiber size. So these are the muscle fibers here, and you can see some are small and some are big. Um, and then you see some areas where maybe the muscle fibers are almost very hard to appreciate. And this is areas of degeneration with inflammation. And all these are characteristics of a muscle biopsy. And I'm going to apologize because my cat is about to join uh, the talk. And um, up here in the top right is just to emphasize this idea that there are uh, multiple different subtypes of muscular dystrophy. And Kitty says hello, but then he's gonna go away. <laughs> and, um, and one of the things I wanna highlight here is that uh, unsurprisingly, uh, many of the genetic, 
different genetic forms encode for proteins that all functionally interact. So here is the dystrophin protein shown right here. And you see it's attached to two different complexes. One is called the dystroglycan complex and the other is the sarcoglycan complex. And genetic mutations in any of the components of these two uh, complexes can also result in a muscular dystrophy that can appear quite similar to Duchenne. Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, in terms of a definition, Duchenne is a genetic disease uh, associated with the signs and symptoms of muscular dystrophy. And all individuals with Duchenne muscular dystrophy harbor a mutation in the DMD gene. And sometimes the terminology gets a little confusing because we refer to Duchenne muscular dystrophy as DMD as well. There's the DMD gene and then the DMD protein. And DMD stands for dystrophin. Um, and uh, one thing I want to point out, because people might start to see this across the medical literature, maybe in your patient chart um, or uh, in, in more common parlance, which is there's a shift now uh, moving away from using the term mutation and instead using the term pathogenic variation or pathogenic variant. So um, they're essentially interchangeable terms, but the more correct genetic term now is pathogenic variant. So the DMD gene or dystrophin gene encodes a protein called the dystrophin protein. And the dystrophin protein is a large anchoring protein found just below the muscle membrane. So again, it's shown right here. Um, and its primary function is to link the muscle membrane and the part outside the extracellular matrix or the part surrounding the muscle fiber with components inside the muscle, including what's called the actin cytoskeleton. And its main function based on this location and the many parts of the protein is to provide a, a stabilizing anchor between external forces and internal changes. Um, and as you could imagine, by performing this anchor function, losing the DMD protein would result in the loss of this stabilizing function uh, in muscle. So in terms of the variants themselves or mutations, the pathogenic variants that in DMD gene that caused Duchenne typically result in the complete absence of the dystrophin protein. And I wanna, refresh everyone from basic uh, genetics 101, which is that we all have DNA and the DNA is segregated into genes and the genes encode proteins through an intermediate called RNA. So DNA is transcribed into RNA, which is then translated into protein. And so when I say that a mutation in DMD DNA results in loss of protein, it also affects the RNA as well. And again, the typical mode of inheritance or mode of genetic pattern is a loss of the dystrophin protein. Uh, and I think probably everyone knows that DMD gene is on the X chromosome. And so um, as such, it is an X-linked disorder that primarily affects boys and men. Uh, though of course there can be uh, symptoms and signs in females as well. And one last point, and I will get to this at the very last slide, which is that, um, Duchenne exists on a spectrum of conditions, all associated with genetic variants in the DMD gene, collectively termed dystrophinopathies. So as I mentioned, the mutations in DMD gene result in loss of dystrophin protein. And this is just a, uh, a immunofluorescence analysis of a muscle biopsy of a patient with Duchenne, uh, showing uh, stains that highlight the dystrophin protein and the absence of those in the, the DMD patient biopsy. And again, as I mentioned, the result of this is loss of dystrophin protein, which causes the muscle membrane to become unstable and to develop small rips and tears when the muscle contracts. And these small rips and tears enable uh, things that are outside the muscle membrane, such as calcium, to leak into the muscle fiber uh, in a way that it's not supposed to. And the leaking in of these, uh, of these components uh, can be quite toxic to the muscle fiber. And that's the main mechanism via which the loss of dystrophin promotes damage to the muscle. Dystrophin also has other signaling functions that will also be interrupted by its loss. And as a result, the loss of the dystrophin protein really promotes a very complex array of abnormalities in the muscle that ultimately leads to the features that we see um, of impaired muscle function, impaired muscle contraction, and muscle weakness. And what I think is important to note about all of these different changes is, first of all, they're all precipitated by the loss of the dystrophin protein. The majority are precipitated secondarily by this loss of the membrane integrity or the, the promotion of membrane fragility. 
And they all represent potential therapeutic targets because as you could imagine, if you could blunt some of these abnormal pathways, even if they're downstream of the fundamental loss of dystrophin, that that would potentially ameliorate some of the pathology or changes seen in the muscle. And I'd highlight one over here, which is inflammation, uh, which is already a target for therapeutic intervention. So uh, most, if not all patients with Duchenne are on glucocorticoid therapy, i.e. deflazacort or prednisone. And that's really targeted at this ab abnormal inflammation that occurs uh, as a downstream consequence of loss of the dystrophin protein. Okay, so now on to the clinical features of the condition. So um, as probably everyone is aware, dystrophin is really a multiphasic and multi-systemic multi disease. Um, and I've listed here sort of the four conventionally classic phases of the condition. Phase one being the diagnostic phase. And this includes the period up until the diagnosis is established. Um, so it's not a single epoch because um, most individuals will have been experiencing symptoms prior to the point at which the diagnosis has been achieved. And I would highlight a, a still continued problem in the field, which is that we know the mean age of first symptoms is around two years and actually probably even earlier. Um, and yet the mean age of diagnosis still remains age four years. And this has been a, a conundrum in the field of how to, of how to solve um, really now on uh, 20 plus years of, of trying to think about this and yet not much progress has been made and certainly is something uh, to continue to discuss how we can make some impact here. Phase two being the early ambulatory phase. And that's again, after diagnosis up until usually about age eight or nine. Phase three being the late ambulatory phase. Um, so these are, this is the period when an individual with DMD starts to have progressive walking difficulties leading ultimately to the loss of independent walking. Phase four is that period right after the loss of independent walking, usually during the teen years. And phase five is the late non-ambulatory period and typically encompasses the adult years. And as I mentioned, this is not just a uh, multiphasic, but also multi-systemic disease. And individuals experience symptoms and signs not only related to skeletal muscle, but also cardiac muscle, um, the, the lungs, so pul uh, pulmonary dysfunction, the brain in terms of potential for learning concerns as well as behavioral concerns, the gut in terms of gut motility uh, as things like constipation are quite common, and also bone involvement, which can be a primary consequence of the disease or else secondary to um, chronic glucocorticoid therapy. So I'm just gonna quickly go through the different phases. So I mentioned uh, diagnostic phase really is the point up until diagnosis. And again, first signs of the condition are usually present by the age of two. Um, when I was in training, the, the, the paradigm was that most, if not all patients did not experience any symptoms until really around the age of a year and a half. Uh, but there's been some great new work coming out to suggest uh, that there really can be signs of the disease that can be picked up in that first year of life. Uh, and I think these are gonna be critical to start recognizing. So hopefully we can begin making that age of diagnosis earlier. And the first signs are often related to, um, to motor dysfunction in terms of difficulties getting up off the ground, uh, delays in walking or abnormal gait. But sometimes the first presentation can really relate to the cognitive developmental domain, including delayed language development. And again, as I mentioned, earlier signs are now being appreciated. In terms of the diagnostic process itself, I'm not gonna go into too much detail because I know that Kim Ambergie later is gonna be talking about genetics, um, but often the diagnosis is aided by a, a test of the blood CPK, which again, as I mentioned, is always elevated in DMD patients. And then the combination of it, of it being a, a male child with gait difficulties and a high CPK usually prompts genetic testing and uh, again, as I mentioned, there's a single genetic cause of Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and that's mutations or uh, variations in the DMD gene. And again, I'm not gonna go into details about the specifics of genetics, because I know that Kim is going to be covering this later. And I just wanted to highlight again that, you know, we all think about the gross motor, uh, meaning, you know, walking, running, stair climbing as being the primary area where we would see disease presentation. But there's a, definite subset of individuals who present first with more neurocognitive concerns. And so I think it's really important to consider these as a, as a way of thinking about um, early diagnosis. So this is from a seminal um, paper from Kate Bushby et al. Um, in, that appeared in Lancet Neurology uh, that it reflects the standards of care 
uh, for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And I believe that Jesse's Journey and MDC have family friendly guides uh, that encompass all of this information. And here is the diagnostics as part of this node. Um, but once the diagnosis is made, a patient with DMD then enters this multidisciplinary care stream uh, that's really multimodal and includes special, uh, specialists across many different domains, as well as interventions across many different domains. So I just wanted to highlight that, you know, after the diagnosis phase that uh, one starts to enter this uh, sort of complicated and, and evolved management phase. And that leads me to the early ambulatory phase. Oh, I did want to highlight one thing, um, so I did have a video, um, which is to show one of the, the most uh, uh, telling and early signs of the condition. Um, and so I'm gonna give him a second, he's gonna do it. <laughs> and that's the positive Gower sign. And it's a very classic way of getting up off the ground. Um, and one of the things that uh, has been a, a, a mission to, is to try to encourage pediatricians and family doctors to, uh, to have all children do the Gower's maneuver because um, again, it's typically always abnormal in a child with DMD. So it could be a good early way of detecting the condition. So in terms of the early ambulatory period, Symptoms can often be minimal. The most common challenges usually relate to stair climbing and keeping up with peers in motor activity, and in particular in sport. Uh, many children are involved in sports activities at this age, and uh, they and their parents will notice that they may have more difficulties than their peers. Fatigue can be a common complaint, as can muscle pain, particularly with a lot of exertion. And this is the phase when neurocognitive challenges sometimes become more apparent, uh, particularly as the child starts to enter elementary school. Uh, and where learning difficulties may be first uh, identified, as well as some of the other uh, neurocognitive challenges. This is a much higher frequency of ADHD, uh, OCD, and, and autism in patients with DMD. And again, this relates to the fact that the DMD protein is important in brain function. So it's not a, it's not a secondary co-association, but rather, rather uh, a result of the primary loss of the DMD protein. And again, this is the phase where steroid therapy is often initiated uh, for, uh, to help with symptoms. So I'm gonna to start to move a little faster. I'm realizing I'm already 15 minutes in. So the late ambulatory phase is when uh, there's increased difficulties with walking, stair climbing and rising from the floor. Fatigue and muscle pain can be more common and exercise intolerance really starts to develop. Uh, and by which I mean, it become, can become difficulty to even walk for uh, short tasks. And even though an individual may still be independently ambulating, uh, may require assist devices for longer activities. This is also the age where cardiac screening and respiratory monitoring first usually start. And again, Great. Oop, I'm gonna... So hopefully you can appreciate how the, um, that Gower's sign is now becoming more prominent and you can see the difficulties with walking there. And so then uh, comes the early non-ambulatory phase. So this is the phase after loss of independent ambulation. So usually again, occurring sometime after the age of 11 and can often be as late as age 15. Um, this is a, a challenging period because there's navigating this loss of independence that comes along with the loss of ambulation. And also the challenges of being a teen in general, uh, which for those of you who have teenagers can appreciate. <laughs> um, and also this sort of uh, dichotomy of uh, the, the need and desire for growing independence uh, balanced with the fact that uh, from a medical standpoint, there's uh, some growing dependence. Um, this is uh, a frequent phase for more frequent monitoring of cardiac and respiratory interventions. And often interventions will be initiated here in terms of heart monitor or heart medicines and, um, and potentially uh, intervention for sleep disorder breathing. Spine curvature can develop at this age, uh, though it's becoming much less common with steroid therapy. And then there's the late ambulatory phase, which is also considered to be the adult phase of the disease. Uh, with this phase is the key transition to adult care providers, and also really the key transition to um, you know, things that we consider to be adult phases of life. So post-secondary education, careers, social life, marriage, children, things like that. Um, and I think an area where we all recognize uh, is increasingly requiring more thought and more support um, as more of uh, the boys with DMD are becoming young men and facing these challenges. Uh, and again, the care considerations here really center around all aspects of the disease, heart and pulmonary health, 
mobility, um, accessibility, and activities of daily living. So again, there's an important balance here between the um, the sort of uh, growing uh, dysfunctions associated with the muscle uh, weakness, uh, but also the growing need for independence as an individual is navigating adult life. And this is just a summary from that same uh, article by Bush et al, really highlighting the different um, domains of care and of care requirements uh, across the different phases of the disease. So I'm gonna just talk very briefly about therapy development because I know there's a lot more to happen with this. Um, but in terms of uh, current standards of care, the mainstays of current treatment uh, include glucocorticoid therapy, as I've already mentioned, cardiac medicines such as ACE inhibitors or beta blockers when indicated, respiratory medicines for uh, good general respiratory health, and also uh, non-invasive ventilation when needed, uh, supportive care related to joint mobility, um, care related to bone health, and then intervention if needed, uh, either for joint contractures or for scoliosis. Um, and I think it's important to note that these interventions have significantly improved uh, the quality and quantity of health for boys with men and men with DMD and have greatly extended life. I should also mention that there's some recent novel therapeutics that have received FDA approval in the US as provisional approval uh, but have not uh, been used commonly in, the, in Canada, largely because the efficacy of these therapies has been unclear. And of course, there remains a great unmet need for new therapy development. Um, and this is just to harken back to what I talked about at the very beginning, uh, this idea that you have the loss of dystrophin protein, which results in membrane damage, and then uh, all of these downstream pathways, uh, which again are uh, ripe targets for potential therapeutic intervention, as is the DMD gene itself. And I think many are aware of the different strategies that are being approached to try to overcome the primary genetic cause. I'm gonna skip through this. Uh, I just wanna highlight at the very end, um, this idea of the spectrum of dystrophinopathies. Um, maybe there are people in the audience who have dystrophin mutations who don't have the classic Duchenne muscular dystrophy phenotype. Um, and again, uh, Duchenne is one condition on a spectrum with other conditions caused by mutations in the DMD gene. Um, there is some good correlation between the type of mutation and whether or not you have Duchenne versus other uh, types of dystrophinopathy. But this is not always the case. And there are certainly some individuals that have a variant that would be predicted to cause Duchenne that is causing uh, a much milder condition, or conversely, one that has perhaps been associated with milder conditions in other individuals but is causing a more severe presentation in the individual. And this just highlights some of the many different types of dystrophinopathies, ranging from the classic Becker muscular dystrophy all the way to uh, individuals who just have elevated blood CPK, but seemingly no other symptoms, a condition that we really don't quite understand uh, other than to describe the phenomenon. And with this, I am at 21 minutes. And so I'm going to stop and take questions. I apologize because I realized I didn't go over um, emergency management questions, um, and I'm happy to field uh, questions or talk further about that in the question and answer if that would be helpful.